Well, we are back again, Thomas Kissinger, once again going to take a stroll down memory lane. This will be Lessons from History, Part 4. We're once again reading from the book of George Saris, Heaven's Doors. And this time we will be featuring the early church father, Gregory of Nyssa. So let's dive right on in. Gregory of Nyssa was a major force in teaching the deity of Christ that prevailed at the Council of Constantinople in A.D. 381. It was there that the Nicene Creed was finally shaped. Gregory actually added the words, I believe in the life of the world to come, to the creed. He died around A.D. 395 and is still revered as one of the greatest of the Eastern Church Fathers. In A.D. 787, the Seventh General Council of the Church honored Gregory by naming him Father of the Fathers. His credentials as an influential leader in the early Christian church have never been questioned, and his position on restoration has never been condemned. Reading his comments alone would dispel the notion that the church has always held to a belief in endless punishment. Gregory based his belief in the ultimate restoration of all on what he saw as, number one, the purpose of punishment, the nature of evil, and the character of God. The purpose of punishment, the nature of evil, and the character of God. Does God punish forever with terrifying pain? Gregory explained that those who are immature think this and fear it. They are thus motivated to flee from wickedness. However, those with more maturity understand the true purpose of after-death punishment. It's a remedial process instituted by God to ultimately restore to health those who are sick. Like a skilled physician who doesn't stop until his work is finished, God does not give up on those he created. Listen to that, ladies and gentlemen. God does not give up on those he created. That's our God and our Father. Here's a quote here from Gregory. If, however, the soul remains unhealed, the remedy is dispensed in the life that follows this. And this, to the thoughtless sort, is held out as the threat of a terrible correction in order that through fear of this painful retribution they may gain the wisdom of fleeing from wickedness. While by those of more intelligence it is believed to be a remedial process ordered by God to bring back man, his peculiar creature, to the grace of his primal condition. But what about those who have hardened their hearts against God? Is there any hope for them? Gregory believed that those who had expressed their faith in this life and had humbled themselves before God through baptism did not need any further purification. However, those who would not repent needed to be purified in the succeeding ages by fire. But as for those whose weaknesses have become inveterate, and this is a quote from Gregory, it is absolutely necessary that they should come to be in something proper to their case. Just as the furnace is the proper thing for gold alloyed with dross, in order that the vice which has been mixed up in them being melted away after long succeeding ages, their nature may be restored pure again to God. For Gregory, Evil is in its nature self-destructive. It will eventually disappear because God is good. His ultimate goal is the final accord of the whole universe with himself. Here's another quote from Gregory. In due course, evil will pass over into non-existence. It will disappear utterly from the realm of existence. Divine and uncompounded goodness will encompass within itself every rational nature. No single being created by God will fail to achieve the kingdom of God. Hear that from Gregory again. No single being created by God will fail to achieve the kingdom of God. What about the powers in the spiritual realm? Is God concerned with that part of his creation as well? 
For Gregory, at the heart of God's character is his grace, which reaches even to the angelic world. Not only would the rational creatures on earth be finally restored, but so would those in the spirit world, including the introducer of evil, the devil. Here's a quote from Gregory again. He accomplished all the results before mentioned, freeing both man from evil and healing even the introducer of evil himself. For the chastisement, however painful, of moral disease is a healing of its weakness. Contemporary scholar John R. Socks, and the last name is spelled S-A-C-H-S, concluded his study of the belief in restoration among the early Alexandrian church fathers with the following observation. None of them denied human freedom and responsibility. Each of them at times has rather traditional things to say about punishment. But what really motivated them was an even stronger conviction about the infinity and incomprehensibility of God's goodness and mercy, revealed and bestowed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There, rather than in the philosophical currents of their times, is where ultimately each of these theologians founded his hope that all will be saved. So, they got their idea for the salvation of all men through the scriptures and through Jesus Christ. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is where they hung their hat, so to speak, on the ultimate restoration of all things. And summarizing here, when Gregory based his belief in ultimate restoration on these three things, it's these three things that really make sense and drive it on home. The purpose of punishment, the nature of evil, and the character of God. So, I want to ask you to search your heart and search the scriptures to understand the nature and purpose of punishment. What is the purpose of punishment? See, we have to understand God is corrective. He's not vindictive. The purpose of punishment is not to torture people forever. The purpose of punishment is to correct. To correct, to restore, to reconcile, and to heal. That is our God who is a loving Father. For those of you who are parents, why do you punish your children? To just inflict pain on them? To just wreak havoc and satisfy your thirst for vengeance? No! You punish them to correct them. The nature of evil. As Gregory brings out, evil is not going to be eternal and exist side by side with God forever and ever, or then we would crown evil as greater than God, because according to what gets taught in evangelical Christianity, untold billions will burn in hell forever, and the evil will never go away, but it just will exist and be quarantined forever alongside of God. No, God is going to burn up evil. God's going to consume evil. God is going to reconcile all evil, including the powers of darkness. Yes, that's what Paul said. Having made peace through the blood of his cross to reconcile all things unto himself, all things, and the powers of darkness fall under the all things that shall be included in the reconciliation. And finally, the character of God. How do you define God? Who is God? What is God? God is love. And all of the other extreme attributes that flow from God, His wrath, vengeance, destruction, judgment, punishment, fire, hell, the lake of fire, all of those things flow out of His love. His character and nature, God is love. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus Christ was lifted up on the cross. And he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will drag all men unto me. He was crucified. He died. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. And his being raised from the dead is the guarantee that the rest of humanity will be raised from the dead. And there'll be a resurrection of the just and a resurrection of the unjust. 
but God is going to correct people. And the reason they can be corrected and purified and go through the fire is because of the blood of his cross, his atonement. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. It is finished. It is done. And it will come to pass in the fullness of time because of the goodness of God and the precious blood of Jesus Christ.